extend their lead in the Atlantic Division. Charlie Coyle and Charlie McAvoy scored the first two goals for the Bruins before Jesper Boquist won it in overtime. The Boston Red Sox played out west again last night. They had a five-game winning streak snapped, a 2-1 loss to the Angels. In addition, the Red Sox played shortstop Trevor Story on the 10-day IL as he undergoes further testing for the shoulder injury he suffered on Friday night. The New England Revolution picked up a 1-0 win over Charlotte FC last night. Carl's Giel scored the lone goal in that game in the third extra minute of the first half. The New England Free Jacks won yesterday as well, beating Miami 25-3. They may remain atop the MLR East Conference. Looking later today, the Celtics host the Portland Trail Blazers at TD Garden. Coverage begins at 5.30 right here on the BetMGM 98.5, the Sports Hub Celtics Radio Network. And March Madness continues this weekend. Men's Final Four last night. Purdue beat NC State 63-50, and UConn beat Alabama 86-72. So it's Purdue and UConn, both one seeds in the national championship on Monday night. Women's national championship, that's tonight. It's a couple of, or this, this afternoon, pardon me, a couple of one seeds again as Caitlin Clark and Iowa look to prevent South Carolina from achieving a perfect season. Sports Hub headlines are brought to you by Cape Cod Lumber and CCL Homescapes, 100% employee owned, your go to independent lumber yard, partner with CCL and CCL Homescapes for all your building needs right in Abington. I'm Alex Barth on Boston's Home for Sports, 98.5 The Sports Hub, your next update at 9 o'clock. Boston's best sports talk is an app for that. Download the Sports Hub app for loads of stuff. Absolutely free. Connect with the shows, get podcasts, and more. Get it where you get your apps. More, more at 98.5 Sports Hub. We win. We protect it. We win. We penetrate. We win. Getting you ready for a long day of football coverage. The Pats, league news, betting lines, and game odds. Sunday kickoff on 98.5 The Sports Hub has it covered. Here are Alex Barth and Sarone Battle. Welcome into a brand new Sports Hub Sunday kickoff, April 7th, 2024. It's Alex Barth and Sarone Battle with you. Ryan beating behind the glass as we get closer and closer to the NFL draft. Sarone, full draft mode today. It's pretty much exclusively what we're going to be talking about. Uh, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm getting geared up for this thing. Like This feels like <laughs> I don't know why. This feels like the longest draft process ever. Maybe because we sort of started it in November and we were mm-hmm. talking about Penix and Daniels in May back as the Patriots were wrapping their season up. But boy, has this one felt like it has uh, gone on a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, one of the differences, Patriot fans usually aren't this invested in the draft, you know, and, and it's been a, a, a talk now, like you said, since last year, once we knew that the team wasn't going to be that great. But it's different around here with the it's like the Celtics is different here, it's different here now because you're so, <laughs> you're so worried. You're, you're really concerned about the draft and they can make it break you. Where in the past, people literally just showed up the week before and all right, who are we picking? But now it's not just you, man. Everybody is actually invested in the draft and cares about it and, and they're wor- worried about it. I'm like a, a dog chasing a car. I finally caught it. Now I don't know what to do with it. I've been begging people to get into college football in the draft around here for a long time. And now they are. And I'm like, no, I want my thing back. Leave me alone. Are you messing it up? But what are you talking about? We are we are in the, the final stage of the pre-draft process. And that is top 30 visits. Uh, mm-hmm. So for people who don't know, it doesn't mean it's the top 30 players on a, on a team's draft board. I think that's in theory what it's supposed to be. But nobody mm-hmm. uses it like that. What top 30 visits are, it's basically the last chance teams have to meet with prospects before the draft. You are limited up to 30 players that you can bring to your facility for workouts, medical evaluations, meetings. You can't do on-field work. You can go elsewhere and work a player out, but you can't do it in your own facility. No idea why that is. That's just what the rule is. So outside of, there is something called a local pro day, which players from local colleges who, who or who are from the area can come in and have like a, a combine. That's its own thing. That doesn't count against this. And the, the Patriots had theirs this week as well. That's lower level prospects. Top 30 visits are guys that are 
almost all are going to get drafted. If not all going to get drafted, they're all priority UDFAs at least. The Patriots have, uh, as we sit here on Sunday morning, 14 of their top 30 visits made public. They may not all get made public. They may not use all 30 like we don't know. But mm-hmm. as of right now, we know of 14 of them. And we'll we'll get to all 14. Or actually, it's 15. The list I'm looking at doesn't have the... Uh, oh, no, it does have J.J. McCarthy. Um, so 14 so far. We'll get to all 14 because there's some interesting non-quarterbacks on this list I want to touch on, certainly. But as, as is tradition at this point, we'll start with the quarterbacks. Drake May was here on Friday. Jane Daniels is expected to be at Gillette Stadium on Monday. And then J.J. McCarthy is expected to come for a visit on Wednesday. My guess is those are the only three of the top court may, of the top quarterbacks we'll see. Do they invite a Spencer Rattler or a Michael Pratt or a Joe Milton down the road? Maybe. But they've shown zero interest in Michael Penix. Mm-hmm. I don't think Caleb Williams is going to take the vid- Like, it's not worth his time to come out here. He's yeah, going he's, to Chicago. Why, why even bother? Yeah. And I feel like we would have heard about Bo Nix with all these other quarterbacks. So I think th- this is the group. I don't like we don't know what goes on in these meetings. We don't know what they do, so it's hard to break them down. But I think that's the analysis of this is as much as Gerard Mayo said five quarterbacks at, at the owners' meetings last month, Caleb Williams isn't really an option. Mm-hmm. And it seems like Bo Nix and Michael Penix aren't part of this final group. So I think these are the three guys you're looking at. Yeah. I mean it it's it's pretty basically the three that everybody everybody has kind of zeroed in the last few weeks and you know, it, it's I'm I'm really curious. Love to be a fly on the wall of what what kind of questions are going back. What kind of questions are they asking these quarterbacks? And on the flip side, what are the quarterbacks asking? You know, the the team, Mayo, wh- whoever's in, involved in these meetings. And I'm wondering if these guys are going in there asking asking Mayo and them. You know, so if you draft me. Are you really going to sit me for a year? <laughs> or are you going to get me receivers? Are you going to get me a tackle? Yeah. <laughs> are you going to make sure I have an offensive coordinator? Yeah, all, all these things. Like, you know, it's like I would love to find out what kind of questions they're asking and what kind of promises are being made to where that kid is sitting there come draft day and hopefully they're not sitting there like, please don't, please not New England, please not New England, you know. Right. Or the other other way around. Like, I I, I want to go to New England. Please, you know, pick me, you know, and and. I'm I'm really curious to how that works out for those guys and and what I want to say the selling point because it's not like these players have the ability to say no. I mean they kind of do, but what are you selling? What are you telling these kids and what kind of promises are you making? So you look at this more as the Patriots selling themselves on the player than the other way around. Then maybe yeah, uh, yeah, that May or Daniels or McCarthy making their yeah. case to the Patriots. Yeah, kind of fifty fifty, both ways. You know, what what yeah. but I'm I'm I, I understand what the young player, what they're thinking, what they're looking for, but what what are the Patriots telling a promise in these? Almost like a recruiting thing in college. Right. Like, I know I'm a five star quarterback, but what can you do for me? Because I, I, I can go anywhere and be the man. But what what promises? Not promises. But what are you? What are you? What are you selling me on this visit? Well, look, we know whoever they take, whether it's a quarterback or not. But at this point, I think we know it's going to be a quarterback. And yeah. you also look and and. They're not, they're not guaranteed to draft the guy they had a top 30 visit with. Mm-hmm. It's tough. In the past, they never drafted the guys they had top 30s with under Belichick. Mm. So you could really? cross all these guys out. At this point, I'd be surprised if the first-round pick isn't somebody they've met with, but they haven't met with any of the first-round guys other than the quarterbacks for top 30 that we know of. They've met with them. That was at the Combine mm-hmm. or whatever, yeah. right? So Joe Alt, Marvin Harrison, Malik Neighbors. These guys haven't had top 30s, but we know whoever they draft, that reaction, when we see it Mm -hmm. on the camera, right, is going to (laughs) get picked apart. Remember Keon White last year? And as we later found out, Keon White, that's just who he is. That's his look. (laughs) That's just what he does. If he won a billion dollars in the lottery, if he won the Powerball, he'd have the same reaction. But whoever it is, and I wonder if there is a little bit of a, you know, Patriots want to get whoever it is excited to be a Patriot, kind of like you said, yeah. and make sure that that guy's coming into it both inwardly and outwardly excited. Yeah. Now, when these guys come, this is a question I don't know. Yeah. Do they bring family, friends, agents, you know, all that stuff? Oh, just a player just comes in almost like a pro day combine type thing. Or does I, he come in like business like with, his, with his, his parents with him and all that type of stuff? So I don't think it's parents. 
I they're okay. not like these aren't they're all different and they're not public. They, the team may be like, hey, if you want to bring your parents, I know usually there's some sort of agent or maybe personal manager or somebody there. Okay. Um, some of it depends on what they want them to do too, right? If a guy's just coming in for a physical, that's different mm-hmm. than if a guy's going to sit in meetings for three hours and break down game tape or this, that, or okay. whatever. Um, yeah. but it's I think I don't think family, I don't think I've heard of that. I think it's mostly the player and then some form of representation, whether mm-hmm. that be an agent, a manager, maybe if the family is their manager, I guess it could happen that okay. way. Okay. Yep. Um, but it's not, I don't think it's this whole, you bring this whole contingent with you because it's okay. a lot of traveling. Some guys have like 15, 16 top 30 visits in the course of a couple of weeks. Okay. So they, they, once he leaves new England, he's off to Buffalo or whatever, you know, I'm just, this right. Is yeah. It's yeah, they just uh, take right off. Okay. It's a circuit. It's you're, yeah. you're going and some guys may only have one or two also like that mm-hmm. definitely happens. Some top yeah. top prospects end up with none. I've heard of guys that end up with non top 30 visits and, you know, draft Twitter freaks out and why does nobody want to meet with him? Oh my God, is he bad? And then it's like, no, he's just really good. Everybody, yeah, nobody they, needed to talk to him. He saw what they needed to say. Yeah, they already know. They, they know what they need to know. Yeah. Okay. Does, so I was one. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. Go, go ahead. Because I was going to move it on to the next thing. No, I was just going to say because I just was curious of how that would work with you know, if you got your friends and not friends, but your family around you and they're yeah. putting stuff in your ear. I don't know. I don't like this. I don't like the way this feels or whatever that type of stuff. But yeah, if it's more business like you come in, watch film, get you know the physicals, whatever it may be, then yeah, I I completely understand that. But I just I just, I just didn't know, so that's why I was asking. Does them hosting Daniels in May? And I asked this to you. I asked this to fans who want to weigh in as well. 617-779-0985. Does them hosting these guys make it feel any more real to you? This is happening. The Patriots are getting a new quarterback. They're trying to get a new franchise guy under center. Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, you know, you got Daniels coming in at the same time as we have an eclipse going on. It's like, that's the guy. This is why this is a sign. Well, Drake may... Ca- okay, so hang on. Let's do it. Let's break this down. Oh, the earthquake. It's a very analytical show. <laughs> Drake May came during an earthquake. Jaden Daniels is coming during an eclipse. We'll see what happens Wednesday with J.J. McCarthy. Maybe nothing happens on Wednesday. Maybe that's the sign. What does it mean, Cerrone? Earthquake like quarterback or eclipse like, wait. quarterback? <laughs> It's like Apocalypto. Like, hold on. Stop the sacrifice. We found our guy. <laughs> but, I mean, hey, at this point, whatever works, get your quarterback. If it, whatever whatever sign you're looking for. It's like, ah, the earthquake wasn't strong enough here, but the eclipse is powerful. Get this kid. But, I mean, it, it fans should be getting excited. I'm excited for it. You know, I, I would love to. I can't wait for them to actually make this pick. I can't wait for them to get there, to get their guy in. And I just, I, I'm curious about the reactions of everybody too. Once they actually do make the pick, but I I think fans should be getting excited. This is a a franchise changing moment. It it could burn and blow up in everybody's face, or it could be you know the next big thing. But I think it's an exciting moment for Patriot fans. It should be. See, I think it'll be mixed. I think you're going to have some fans that just they need a guy to root for. Team has very little. Uh, star power, had very little star power last year. Here's a top five quarterback, name brand. That's our guy. Go buy the jersey, draftsman fantasy. Mm-hmm. And I think there's going to be another group of fans that are so scarred by the last four years and specifically what happened with Mac Jones that they're not going to allow themselves to be optimistic about it because Mac Jones had a good rookie year. And then mm-hmm. look what happened. And so yeah. it'll be interesting to see which which group you know, wins out in the sense of which is bigger. But I think some fans, once the pick is made, they'll be like, all right, we got our guy. And some of that, some fans may be waiting to see which quarterback it is, depending on which group they fall into. But I think there's some fans that are going to be like, I'll believe it when I see it. They they yeah. drafted him, but they haven't developed him. When I'll believe this guy's a franchise quarterback when I see it. I'm not going to get my hopes up. Yeah, I mean, it, it's... It, it, yeah, I mean, you're spot on. And then you got some, even if the kid has a good year, like you said, oh, Matt Jones had a good year. It's it's going to take three years before they come over and say, okay, maybe he's a good quarterback. And But I think people's, because expectations, I think, are going to be so spread out. What what constitutes a good season to you? Everybody's going to give a different answer. Or seven wins, or I don't know, a playoff spot. Or, uh, we only count championships around here. You're going to get that guy, too. So, I mean, it's it's... Yeah, I mean, it's people are going to be all over the place with it, but I think everybody's going to be paying attention. I think it will be the story of the summer, 
you know, anything short of, you know, Celtics and Bruins winning it all. But I think this will be the, the quarterback will be the most talked about thing this summer. 617-779-0985. You want to weigh in on the quarterbacks. But uh, I do also want to talk about some of these top 30 visits the Patriots had with non-quarterbacks because there's some interesting names on the list, including the guys who could maybe be protecting the quarterbacks. We'll get to that next. We're off and rolling here on the Sports Hub Sunday kickoff. More Sunday kickoff coming up on the Sports
game starts with a kickoff. This is Sunday Kickoff with Alex Barth and Sarone Battle on your home for Patriots football. 98.5 The Sports Hub. Back here on Sports Hub Sunday Kickoff. Again, you want to weigh in on the quarterback, 617. 617- 779 Alex Barth and Saron Battle. As we just talked about, the Patriots hosted a, a couple quarterbacks for top 30 visits or will be hosting uh, between last week and this week. That is Drake May. That is Jane Daniels. That is J.J. McCarthy. But the Patriots have 14 top 30 visits on the book. They've only met with uh, three quarterbacks. If you want to see the full list of Patriots pre-draft meetings, check out the pre-draft meeting tracker on 985thesportshub.com. You can find that on the draft hub page. If you go to 985thesportshub.com slash draft, uh, but Saron uh, among the list, and I'll just give some of the bigger names here. Some names that people may have heard of wide receiver, Javon Baker from UCF tackle Kingsley Suamatia from BYU. Uh, Edge rusher Austin Booker from Kansas. Again, these are just the non-quarterback names. Tackle Blake Fisher from Notre Dame. Tight end Jared Wiley from TCU. And this one this morning from Mike Reese. Tackle Tyler Guyton from Oklahoma. For me, Guyton stands out the most. I love Guyton for the Patriots. I think he would be a fantastic pickup. Now, 34, getting him at 34 might be tough. He's a fringe first-round pick but I think he's going to end up sliding into the first round. He may be one of these guys we've talked about trading up from 34, or if you trade back, I guess, from from three, but even trading up mm-hmm. from 34, getting him in the late 20s. Uh, spoiler alert, I have a new mock draft dropping tomorrow, 98.5thesportshub.com. I have them trading up and taking Guyton. You'll have to check out and see how far up I have them moving. But this is a guy, first off, tremendous size, six foot eight, 322 pounds, was a right tackle in a lefty quarterback offense, has the athleticism to play both sides uh, of the a line of scrimmage, has great size. His technique, just he, he's big, and he's used to winning because he's big. So he needs to become a little more technically sound, but this is a, a coaching staff and an offensive line coach, Scott Peters, that worked with Dewan Jones last year, the massive tackle from Ohio State. Is Guyton a day one starter? He might not be. Is he a year one starter? Yes, Does he have franchise left tackle potential? Yes. And he can also play on the right side. So as they rebuild this offensive line, a guy like Guyton, you're not, you know, pigeonholed into, okay, this is the only spot we can play him. You can, and he should eventually find a final spot. You can move him around. And if you decide, Mm -hmm. hey, you know, we have a chance next year to get a great left tackle and we can move him to the right side and move on Wenu back into guard. Like you have options on the table. So I was very excited to wake up this morning and see they met with Guyton. Yeah, me uh, as you were say, as you were talking about him, I could see you getting you excited about him. <laughs> Will that, like, say, okay, they take their quarterback, third pick, whatever, they stay at three, take their quarterback. Yeah. If they take somebody like that with the very next pick, would that ease your feelings not only about that position but about the quarterback as well? Okay, they got their left tackle as well as they got a good left tackle. Well, they got not sure where he's going to go exactly, like you said. But they improve their line after taking the quarterback, and would make would that make you feel a lot better than if their very next pick after that they go receiver? Um, I I, I guess it depends on the receiver. Like, okay. so we've talked about this. I'm very high on AD Mitchell from Texas. Mm-hmm. These are if they get one of these two guys at 34. Right? It's different. It's different ways to do it. I feel okay. better about it some ways. I'd feel worse about it some ways. Some of it depends on the quarterback. If they got a guy like Drake May, somebody like Guyton makes a lot more sense. If they get a guy like mm-hmm. Daniels, somebody like uh, A.D. Mitchell makes sense. I'll say this. I, I would feel good in the long term. I, I, I we, We've joked about this, that mm-hmm. I've covered the team for six years. Now I've never covered an offseason where left tackle wasn't a question to some extent. Yeah. I would feel pretty good about, hey, next year, maybe we do talk about it because there's the option to move him to right. Mm-hmm. But like at least one of their tackle spots is solid. I think he's a guy that can come in and play, again, maybe not a day one starter, should yeah. be a year one starter, and has that upside to be a 10-year set it and forget it tackle. Okay. Okay. Because I, mean, I, I look at it, you know, I think there's – I mean, they, they brought the kid in, so they, they, they're they definitely interested in him. Yeah. But I wouldn't – I'm kind of – the more I go, I wouldn't be surprised if they did load up on, on – on Tackle help. Let I me mean, just offensive line help in general. 
um, just based off of the the staff that they brought in and those guys. I believe they're and we've said this before in here. They like to run the ball a lot. This is just this is who they are, and I think they beefing up the offensive line. I can see that being a pro- after they get their quarterback. Right. I can see that right. being their key priority throughout the majority of this draft and try and find more skill players in other ways during the rest of the offseason via trade or anything, uh, uh, players getting released or something like that. But I can see them going real heavy on the offensive line. And look, some fans are going to love that, and I think some fans will kind of be mad at it, like, oh, this is boring. But in the long run, we'll, we'll appreciate them for doing that. Well, we'll find out which fans know ball and which fans don't. Um, <laughs> no, but the, the meetings yeah. – shape up that way because you have Guyton mm-hmm. and you have uh, Sumatia who are both in that late yeah. first early second round range Sumatia some people have him moving up into the late first he, he's more realistic at 34 than Guyton I, I'd say mm-hmm. more likely than not and honestly if he goes somebody probably got jumped and maybe it pushes a guy like Guyton or a guy like Amari Smims down the board but so they've got a couple options at 34 Blake Fisher who they met with from Notre Dame is an interesting prospect. He's a guy you'd look at at that 68th pick or maybe 103. Uh, mm-hmm. So he was he played opposite Joe Alt. So he was the starting left tackle at Notre Dame three years ago, got hurt in the first game. Joe mm-hmm. Alt comes in, obviously wins the job. Fisher comes back the next year and has been the starter at right tackle the last two years. So guy, again, that can play on both sides, uh, which is helpful. And then they've met with some I would say encouraging day three options. I really like Travis Glover from Georgia State, who had a really good senior bowl. They've met with him a couple of times now, plays with a ton of nasty, great size. So they seem to kind of be trending in that direction in terms of they're Mm -hmm. doing their work on tackles up and down the draft, which sometimes is a sign of, yeah, we know we want to take a tackle. We don't know where we're going to take them. But in a case like this, as you're saying, could be a sign that, they want to take multiple tackles and they want to be ready at all points. The other, yeah, I mean, inter- or, go about, ahead. Go. Now go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, the other oh, interesting go. group of people they've met with are the edge rushers. Mm-hmm. Cause they've met with a couple interesting ones. Austin Booker from Kansas was a reserve at Minnesota the last couple of years. Just did not play transfers to Kansas this season, breakout year, eight sacks. He might be a top 100 pick, but he is mm-hmm. their kind of rusher. So if they're going to kind of go a little higher on defense at edge rusher, than we think he could be a guy. And then, one of the most interesting players in the draft. This guy's fascinating. He's a day three pick. Jalex Hunt from Houston Christian, formerly Houston Baptist. Okay. His career began at Cornell as a safety. He played two years at Cornell. Well, three years at Cornell. He was at Cornell for three years, but one year was the pandemic year, so they didn't play. He was a safety, but he really only played special teams. He didn't play a ton of defense. Transfers to Houston Christian. Puts on like 30 pounds and becomes an edge rusher and has shown tremendous growth in that regard. He's still obviously incredibly raw, but he's a great athlete, great size. He's come a long way in a short amount of time. He's somebody's going to take him on day three with the idea of like a two or three year project to really build this guy into a weapon. And yeah, for where they're at, the place. Yeah. yeah, for where they're at, they can buy a year on a pass rusher, right? The idea would be you draft yeah. him. He, he kind of red shirts. And then when Josh Uche's contract is up, you see what happens with Judon. You have a guy you've been working with who's maybe ready for a bigger role. Yeah, the in in again, it's you're talking about them looking at defensive guys, edge rushers. I think it'd be crazy to think a head coach like Mayo, a defensive minded guy, would get out of this without getting something from the defensive side <laughs> the defensive side of this draft. I think he I think he's gonna try and get him a stud. I don't know how early. But I can see him still constantly trying to improve that defense. But I think the defense is going to be pretty good this year. But I can still see him trying to get something on that defense. I don't know about, you know, Ed, like you said, edge rush. You got Judon's situation, Uche, you know, Keon White coming back next year. I hope he has a big season. Um, had a cool call yesterday about that. Young, a young kid call. It, it was beautiful. Nice. But <laughs> I, I, I would, I want to see what Mayo is going to do with the defensive side of the ball in this draft. Is he going to overlook it or is he going to go all in on this? And, you know, I, I don't know if I if I want to see a defensive – I want to see edge rush before I see a running back. But, again, going with the way this coaching staff is, the guys he brought in, like I mentioned, with running game being their thing, get strengthening up the offensive line, will they go add a running back to that or will they just strengthen the trenches? Will this be an offensive line thing? 
edge rusher offensive line, edge rusher offensive line after they get their skill guys. But I just I'm curious to see how Mayo plays this. And it's just a weird thing to not weird, but you kind of knew Belichick's thing going into a lot of these drafts. You knew what he was looking for. But with Mayo being new here, I'm I'm not sure exactly what he wants, but or what the fans want, if that, if that makes any sense. But I would love to see what he does on the defensive side of the ball. 617-779-0985. You want to tune in, you want to call in, talk draft. We'll do more of that next here on the Sports Up Sunday Kickoff. Stay tuned for more Sunday Kickoff.
Power against Embiid. Tatum for a 50 piece. You're listening to the home of Boston Celtics basketball. 98.5 The Sports Hub. Alex Barth and Sarone Battle are here. Talking football every Sunday morning with the insiders and with you. It's Sunday kickoff on 98.5 The Sports Hub. I know we're not supposed to spoil picks. We'll see how the commanders decide to move forward with the number two overall selection. But a little over a few weeks out, to me, I think the signs continue to point to Jaden Daniels being the second overall pick at number two. Seems like he's popular in the scouting community. Seems like he would bring a lot of the attributes that the commanders would like. I think Jaden Daniels would have a high level of interest in the Las Vegas Raiders. And the Las Vegas Raiders would have a high level of interest in Jaden Daniels. But there's one problem. The commanders have the second pick. And I think Jaden Daniels is going to be somebody that really appeals to them, as he would a lot of teams, as talented as he is. And it's hard for me today to see Jaden Daniels sliding much past pick number two. So let's pencil him in there. And I know we're not supposed to reveal the picks in advance. We don't know what the picks will be. We'll see how the shakes out. I think that's how it's stacking up a few weeks out. Caleb Williams won, Jaden Daniels two, and then the New England Patriots would be on the clock at number three with the possibility of taking Drake May at number three in New England. Good call on the song. How's Adam Schefter this week on his podcast? What is going on there? So it, l- <laughs> let's backtrack a little bit here, Sir Rock. Because I, 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 me thinks there's some breadcrumbs. Yeah. This was last week. We played this last week, Ryan. Do we have it? Of Jane Daniels college coach Brian Kelly. When he oh, yeah. was asked about Daniels' future. Ryan. He, he is going to be so committed to taking care of himself that you don't have to worry about size or he doesn't weigh enough. Uh, Lamar's done a pretty good job with his size. I think uh, Mahomes, I wouldn't consider him a giant because he's going to get the ball out to the playmakers and, and make plays uh, for Washington. Ooh, for who? For Washington. That's right. <laughs> All right. So, and a lot of people kind of pointed out that Brian Kelly was specifically asked about the commander Washington, when he was yeah. asked that question, but... I've heard enough coaches ask the question, what would so-and-so player do for so-and-so team and give a very general answer? You don't usually see them give a specific. So people were quick to pour water on that and fair. But then Adam Schefter, let's let's put it on the table here. Adam Schefter knows things. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, he does. And what what did he have to say, Ryan, about Jane Daniels again? Run that back for me. If we have it. I know we're not supposed to spoil picks. We'll see how the commanders decide to move forward with the number two overall selection. But a little over a few weeks out, to me, I think the signs continue to point to Jaden Daniels being the second overall pick at number two. Seems like he's popular in the scouting community. Okay. So now we have Adam Schefter. You know what that sounded like to me? Where he says... Yeah, I know we're not supposed to tip picks, but that that sounds (laughs) like a guy who knows something, whose network wants people to watch the draft, so they don't want all the picks known ahead of time. That's what that sounds like to me. And I know there was, and and keep in mind, after all of this, a report came out this week that Adam Peters loves Drake May, and he used to just go down to UNC and watch him practice. He used to go (laughs) hang out. In Chapel Hill (laughs) and watch it. So, again, are there some breadcrumbs here? Yeah. Are there some breadcrumbs here? Because we came away from the pro days the other week, and based on the sound that was coming out of that, I said, "Uh, you know, maybe. Because I've been been Jaden Daniels second overall since, like, December. I've been on that since December. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of sitting there like, all right, yep, yeah, I think he's going second. And, And then after the pro days... I still feel the same way about the player, but mm-hmm. I wonder if maybe I was wrong about how the league saw him. Now I'm hearing all this. Chef, yeah. we can't tip the picks, but I know we're not supposed we to spoil picks. Them in. Right. So give me <laughs> one more time, Ryan. Give me that clip one more time. I know we're not supposed to spoil picks. And then he spoils the pick. Yeah. Are you, buy, are you buying what I'm selling, Saron? Yes, absolutely. And the thing about Schefter, we call a little hypocrisy here. Nobody spoils the draft more than Adam Schefter. Do not go on Twitter, X, whatever, <laughs> on draft day. This dude would be three picks ahead 
of what's actually going on on live TV. And you're sitting there like, he just killed it. He does it every year. It's like, I don't want to spoil anything, but I have the first five picks right here on my <laughs> phone ready to go. It's like, dude, shut up. No, just Stop I, with the, the hypocrisy. I do have to push back on you a little bit. The best at spoiling the draft is Woj. Because yeah, he does true. that thing where he says, like, so-and-so team is is and he uses like it's weird words like so and so team is very high on the idea of taking so and so at three or so and so team <laughs> yeah. is deeply intrigued. So let's this pencil player. him in there, and I know we're not supposed to reveal the picks in advance. Sorry, sorry, ESPN bosses. I know I'm not supposed to do this. And you know, credit to Schefter. Yeah. I, I'll say credit to Schefter. I know you want to push back on him a little bit. It's his job. <laughs> it's his right. job. He it's, knows it's things he job. shares it with yep. us. I know it, I'm not it, it supposed gets... to tip the pick, but here so in anyway. in. like we won't be watching. Like, like everybody's. Oh, well, I already know the second overall picks. So I'll, I'll just tune in at eight forty-five instead of eight thirty. No, we're gonna be watching, and we're gonna have. And, and I talk so much trash about Shifter to Woj too. Woj on draft days, he's, he's they're horrible human beings. But I will <laughs> have my notifications turned on for both of them because I want to <laughs> see exactly what's gonna happen. Before it happens. But, yeah, I mean, when he says stuff like that, it's like, okay, well, who are the Patriots drafting then? Let's let's go on and move. We got picks one and two. is already done two weeks ahead of time. Let's go ahead and move on to pick three and see what he, see what kind of breadcrumbs he leaves to Foxborough. Well, I remember a couple of years ago they made a point. Because you used to know, like, the first pick we'd find out kind of right about now, usually early April, the team would, you know, you'd get some report. Yeah, yeah they're taking this player. Yeah. You'd get the second pick, maybe the week of the draft. You might even get the third or fourth the day leading up. And then it was 19. It was the Kyler Murray draft where they did like nobody, nobody said anything. And it was actually kind of mm-hmm. cool to watch yeah. the draft go through. And I appreciate not tipping picks. I need quick story time here. This would have been the 2013 draft. It's the Aaron Dobson draft. And I'm in college and I'm watching the draft with a couple of friends, and we all agreed. All right, nobody look at the phones because they tipped the picks and we want to enjoy this and we want to see, you know, how many, you know, we want to play along and where's this guy going to go. And my buddy's sitting in the back of the room and he keeps going, oh, they're taking this guy. Oh, they're taking this guy. Oh, they're taking this guy. And he's just like 35 picks in a row he rolled off. <laughs> to this day, he will not admit he was looking at his phone. He was in the back of the room, so we couldn't see him. I still think he was looking at his phone. But if not... It was one of the most impressive things I've ever seen. <laughs> he had something back there. He had to have, right? Something. Yeah. Still won't admit <laughs> it to this day. <laughs> so, all right. How you, Jane Daniels, it sounds like it's second. How are you feeling about Drake May? How are you feeling about him for the Patriots? I'm fine. I mean, I, I, at this point, I've been fine with either one of those guys. You know, I'd be fine with Penix, too, to be honest with you. But yeah. I'd, I'd be fine. And I think just no matter which one you pick, each one's a little. Each one of those three guys are a little different in their own own way, but I think now the pressure would be on the coaching staff. It's up to them to get that to clean up whatever issue that player has that kept him from being number one. Okay, Jane Dan's for size. It's you know you don't slide. You, you take care of your body. You take some shots. Okay, let's work on this for you. Prolong your career, Drake May. Some decision making you do. You do this. You do that under certain situations. Let's clean that up. You know, there's different things that the coaches now are going to have to do the work. They're going to have to earn their money. They're going to have to develop these guys and clean up whatever issues they had and make them into these Pro Bowl-level quarterbacks that we think all these guys potentially could be. And it all will fall on them. I think just whichever one you pick is just pretty much us fighting as fans over who we prefer. But the reality is it's going to come down to the development of these quarterbacks and how they handle them during the off seasons and during in end game situations. You're exactly right. Nature versus nurture. I've said this. I've been red in the face about it. I'm already sort of starting to put together my post draft column because if they take a quarterback, <laughs> I'll be ready. That's basically, hey, this yeah. isn't as long as this whole process felt. Drafting a quarterback is not the end of the process. It's only the beginning. Quick note on Penix because you mentioned him. This was from Albert Breer yesterday. One interesting thing I've picked up on making calls this week. Coaches seem to be higher than scouts on Washington QB Michael Penix in general. Some have him ahead of the presumed top guys, including Caleb Williams. And then Mike Giardi added, if his medicals are clean-ish, Penix is going round one. To which I say, welcome to the party. (laughs) Welcome to the party. Glad to have you. A little late. I don't know what's left for for drinks and snacks. You can go see what's there. Pencil him in. Yeah, pencil him in. I, him in the first round. Michael Penix to me is 
a victim of the pre-draft process in that this thing goes on so long and you get into the nitty gritty and look, you do need, you don't just want to make the idea without as much information. You make the decision without as much information mm-hmm. as possible. But I think externally, people who aren't doing like making the picks for their jobs, you can mm-hmm. get so in the weeds. It's easy to lose sight of the fact that sometimes a guy can just freaking play. Yeah. At and the end of the day, at a yeah. certain point, and I, I said this on Felger Mass because Felger is needling me. If I like Penix so much, why don't I want him at three? The knee injury is real. That's a real thing, and and I understand why teams are concerned about that. I have my reservations about it. Maybe mm-hmm. not as much as some people, but I do. But at the end of the day, the guy can freaking play. And mm-hmm. if you know, if it's him or a guy without the knee issues, and I think both guys can play. Yeah, I'll take the guy without the knee issues. Yeah. If it's him or passing on a quarterback. Or him or taking a quarterback, I think it's clearly worse, but as a clean bill of health, <clears throat> Bo Nix, that to me is it no. Yeah. Go get I'll go take the good quarterback. And the fact that it's the coaches versus the scouts, I find very interesting because the the coaches' jobs aren't necessarily on the line with the pick. Their jobs are on the line with the development. They see a guy who can play. The scouts mm-hmm. see, well, I I don't want to get blamed if the medicals are off. And I think that's where you get that that difference. Yeah, and, and the, the the coach is looking at it the way you're looking at it. No, the kid can play. <laughs> right, exactly. I don't care. I, I want a guy. I want guys that can play. I want fifty guys on here that can ball. He can ball. And I, I just for the life of me, I can't figure out how we saw that season for Michael Penix. Yes, he struggled against Michigan. Everybody did. But how we saw him play, the way he throws at his combine, pro days, whatever. How does he slip behind a JJ McCarthy? Doesn't make any sense to me. I, I just. I can't see how anybody heading into the end, the, the college playoff would have ever said J.J. McCarthy is a better quarterback than, than Michael Penix. There's no way. I mean, maybe playing on the West Coast, no one got a chance to see him. I think that's part but of it. He's, I mean, it may be, but we saw Kayla Williams out there. And we you know what? Shadow he's also Sanders. behind Bo Nix for some people. Yeah. That doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> I, I, I've, It has been my biggest... The J.J. McCarthy hype, I, I've been kind of strong. I, I I don't love it, but I get it. Like, I understand why people are drooling. Again, it happened with Will Levis last year. I understand yeah. why people are drooling over him. I thought maybe mm-hmm. we'd, we'd learned our lesson. We were better than this. I, I can I can wrap my head around why that's happening, even if I don't agree with it. Yeah. The but, the Michael Penix being an afterthought, which yeah. now I think, again, welcome to the party. Yeah. I think we've caught up with. So yeah, I mean, just real quick, if Michael Penix was yeah. playing at Michigan, he would go number one. Oh, absolutely! <laughs> the, the numbers he would have put up at Michigan oh. would have been incredible. <laughs> oh, and throw it to Roman Wilson and Colson Loveland. Absolutely, with behind that line and with that run game and defense. Come on, absolutely. Now. <laughs> if you want to weigh in on the quarterback, six one seven 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 nine zero nine eight five. But we did get a fun piece of Patriots nostalgia this week. I want to talk about that next here on the Sports Hub Sunday Kickoff.
Sunday kickoff with Alex Barth and Saron Battle on your station for the best football coverage. 98.5 The Sports Hub. Who was one of the players you were most impressed with scouting? No, I'll tell you, the one that was most impressive pregame, hands down, was Peyton Manning. And so many of these teams, they have their quarterbacks are out there. They're doing their drops half speed. They're listening to the music. No, Peyton Manning, he came out on that field. His cleats hit that grass. He was all business, everything, full speed. It's no screwing around here. I made a point of spending an hour a day at least studying the Colts. And the thing was, everybody was trying to play him and cover three and cover one and they killed him running up the scene. Dallas Clark? Oh my God, it was a slaughter. I said, we can't do this. We need to go in and play cover four. This is maybe two years ago. I'm watching the simulcast, Eli and Peyton Manning. Somebody's playing cover four and Peyton Manning goes, yeah, cover four. I don't really like my in cuts and my seams against that. And I'm sitting there thinking, yes, that's why we played it. (laughs) They made my day. That was Ernie Adams on a podcast. Who would have thought? But no, we got Ernie Adams on Julian Edelman's podcast, Games with Names, uh, this week. Like two hours. And part of it was breaking down Super Bowl 36, but they got into some other stories as well. If if you haven't, so I, I, I'll say this before I even say if you haven't listened to it yet. Watch it. I actually waited. It dropped, I think it was like Tuesday morning, whatever morning. But they said they were releasing it on YouTube at three. And I was like, no, I got to see this. And it was worth the wait. So there were a ton of good stories that came out of it. Of Ernie Adams, just kind of behind the scenes of the dynasty. But I, I will say my favorite actually had nothing to do with the Patriots. The Packers. <laughs> no, my favorite was that Ernie Adams is indirectly responsible for the writing of the book, Friday night lights. Yeah. That, that's which spawned hilarious. one of the greatest football movies of all time. And my forever movie hot take, Friday Night Lights, the movie, much better than Friday Night Lights, the TV show. Much better. Yes. But. I mean, there's some scenes in there that just uh, iconic from that movie. Amazing (laughs) football movie. Amazing sports movie. So for those who don't know, and I'd go check it out. But basically, the guy that wrote Friday Night Lights went to high school with Ernie Adams and Bill Belichick. He was the writer Mm -hmm. covering the high school football team. He was a student. And so they knew him. Ernie and Bill knew him. And, and down the road, the writer, uh, 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 Buzz uh, Barringer, I think it is, mm-hmm. reached out to Ernie Adams. Was like, I'm going to write a book about high school football. I'm going to go to Western Pennsylvania because that's where he was from. And Ernie Adams says, no, I'm going to set you up with this guy who will tell you, you know, you should go to West Texas because that's where high school football is real. And he sets him up with some guy at UCLA who tells him, go to Odessa Permian. It's Bissinger. Sorry, it's it's Buzz Bissinger. Mm-hmm. And uh, so Buzz Bissinger goes to Odessa, Texas, Odessa Permian, and writes Friday Night Lights. What? How much more happiness in my life is Ernie Adams responsible for <laughs> that I don't even know about? I That was such, for a guy that is so shrouded in mystery and this ultimate football historian, for that to be tied in, I, I, I've been th- I can't stop thinking about it all week. So there was some other good stuff, too. He told an interesting story about Peyton Manning you heard off the top. Interesting story about uh, Joe Burrow interviewing him before the draft. But the, the the whole thing, I thought, was just fantastic. And I think that's why I would love to see guys like him and Bill, not so much on doing these podcasts or whatever, but these NFL pregame shows, these college shows, because I think their insight on stuff like that would be great TV. I think that's the stuff people want. That's the stuff people want to listen to. It reminds me of when uh, NBA TV did the, the open court series used to come on, and it was old guys like Ernie Adams, old players, GMs, and they would just sit around on the couch, just random questions. You know, what guy couldn't you cover? What guy gave you fits that was a bum player? And they would just talk about it for an hour. And I think guys like Ernie Adams and Belichick, them two on a podcast alone would probably be excellent. Yeah. But I think them telling these old stories and game insight strategies, I think that would be excellent TV, and I would love to see them on a, a national platform doing this every Sunday. Boy, and I, look, credit Julian Edelman, too. He did a great job of mm-hmm. you know executing the interview, and you can tell he's locked in the whole time. But to your point about like the pregame stuff, remember in the Super Bowl, we we're all wondering the Niners decided to kick because mm-hmm. they wanted the third possession, and that was the whole argument, and 
it, live, nobody really knew what to make of it because it had never come up before. It was the first time since they changed the overtime rules that you were in this yeah. kind of situation. And that was – Ernie Adams talks about it, and, and he puts Kyle Shanahan, and he puts the nerds in their place. And that was another great part. He's like, <laughs> of course you kick the ball. Of course you take the ball second. You know, you, and if, you know he says it in the Ernie Adams way, not like that. But mm -hmm. So you, you had him going in on the nerds. You had the old school Patriots behind the scenes stuff. You, yeah. you had Friday Night Lights, like, but but no, like something like that. I think you know to have, and I don't. You're not gonna have Ernie Adams call the Super Bowl, but I'm saying, imagine if he was on like the post game show, or imagine if he had a regular show. And I don't think ever gonna get Ernie to do this regularly, but Bill, no. And he said he yeah. texted Bill. That's how the story came up. He texted mm -hmm. Bill, hey, we would have kicked here. I, I I don't know, and and Bill said he didn't want to do the weekly shows and. I kind of don't blame him for that, but yeah. he should do some sort of, so like LeBron has this show now with JJ Redick, right? Yep. Where I think they do that once a week. Yep. Where they sit down and they just, they talk ball. Just talk. Yeah. That's it. Yep. It's not really storylines. It's not really narratives. I don't think they get a ton into like what's going on in the league right now or give takes. Yeah. They just sort of break. Hey, this inbounds play was super hard to defend, and they detail it for 20 minutes, why it's hard to defend, mm -hmm. how you defend it. Bill, in that sort of setting, you need to get... So, like, J.J. Reddick's really good to put with LeBron because he he's done more media. He can drive the bus, and I think he's not afraid to kind of needle LeBron a little bit. Yeah. If you could find a former coach like that, I, not, I, I wouldn't go McDaniels. I wouldn't go somebody Bill has coached a ton with, but... Mm -hmm. That sort of format I, is where I would love to see Bill Belichick. Like once a week, just football philosophy. And maybe you use the plays from the week before as a jumping off point, but mm -hmm. it's not specifically about that. And that's something to me you could maybe talk Bill into because if he wants to get back into coaching, he can't be out there bad mouthing people. He can't be out there saying, well, this guy sucks. Not yeah. that I mean, not that he necessarily do that, but if you're talking in the general, it gives him the freedom to go back and not burn any bridges, which. Sometimes happens when you get when you get in the media, when former yeah. players get in the media. So it would kind of give him an out from that. And Rook, re remember ESPN had a thing they were doing. I think it was on ESPN Plus. It was Peyton Manning and Kobe Bryant. I think it was called like Spotlight or oh, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah, that sounds. And familiar. they would just highlight a player in a certain play, and this is why this worked. This is why this didn't work. And they just kind of talked over it. I think Bill would be so good at that, and I think he's comfortable doing that. I think. You know, it's like, oh, he doesn't open up. He doesn't talk much. He does when you talk football. When right. you talk old school football, he doesn't shut up. I think you need to let him do something like that. Just kind of keep his name going out there, just breaking down. Like you said, not bad-mouthing guys, but kind of saying great things about players and coaching decisions. You know, I think that would be really cool if people would tune into that. Take the Bell Strader National. That's it. Maybe that's what Basically, you do. Basically, yes. There you go. Take the Bell Strader on a uh, cross-country tour. <laughs> oh, no. I know who it should be. Him and Saban. Oh, my God. And then find a third person to just sit there and get you in and out of the reads and stuff like that. That's it. That's what Saban it should be. Saban and Bill. I did see when Bill, uh, when, when Bill left the pad, somebody tweeted, like, um, bar rescue, but it's Saban and Bill going to different teams every week and, <laughs> and fixing football teams. I would, this is sucks. This I would stuff. walk in on that. I, that would be, I think, whatever team has the worst week, College or pro, you figure out right, his team was terrible, and you can only get him once a year. And you send Bill and Saban there for a week, and they try yeah, to turn it around. I think it colleges would be so much better. Just some programs that have That's been true. terrible for and like twenty years. Bill's like a college football guy now. He's yeah, out in Washington. Just, he had the Huskies gear on. <laughs> just just walking around different facilities, like you know, like not. Um, I can't think. Like Curry College, just go to Curry College. Like, what is this? It just. I, we can't take you serious. No, I even just... send them to, to D1 schools. Yeah, send BC, to... all of them. Well, BC would be hilarious because Bill O'Brien. Oh, but that's like, right. Can't you do know, that. When Iowa last year couldn't score more than five points. <laughs> or you send them to, uh, you know, Michigan State when they were falling apart or something like that. Is so Nick Saban go to some school he's beaten <laughs> like 50 times in a row. Right. You wonder why you suck. Is... That would be great. I, the idea's there. Any TV networks want to pick it up. The idea's there. <laughs> Six one seven 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 nine zero ninety eight five. Where would you? What school would you want to see Bill Belichick go for one week and try and turn around? A uh, quick check of the headlines here. Ninety seconds, no commercials, and then we come back. Big story in the NFL this week: a trade. Could it impact the Patriots? Short term, long term. Again, just ninety seconds, no commercials, and then we'll get into that here on the Sports Hub Sunday kickoff. Easy, 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 easy.
Frost from the Town Fair Tire Studios, home of the Celtics, Bruins, Revs, and Patriots. Boston's home for sports is 98.5 The Sports Hub. He's leading the group station. Sports Hub Headlines. The Bruins picked up a very important win last night, beating the Florida Panthers 3-2 in overtime at TD Garden to extend their lead in the Atlantic Division. Charlie Coyle and Charlie McAvoy scored the first two goals for the Bruins before Jesper Boquist won it in overtime. The Red Sox had a five-game winning streak snapped last night. They fell to the Angels 2-1. Sox also placed shortstop Trevor Story on the 10-day IL as he undergoes further testing for a shoulder injury he suffered earlier in the series. The Rev picked up a win yesterday, 1-0 over Charlotte FC. Har- Carlos Giel scored the lone goal in that game in the third minute of extra time in the first half. And the New England Free Jacks won, beating Miami 25-3. They made it top the MLR Eastern Conference. Looking later today, the Celtics host the Portland Trail Blazers at TD Garden. Coverage begins at 5.30 right here on the BetMGM Celtics Radio Network. And in March Madness action, Final Four last night, Purdue beat NC State 63-50. UConn beat Alabama 86 to 72. It means it'll be a couple of one seeds in the national championship on Monday. Women's national championship coming up this afternoon. Also two one seeds as Caitlin Clark and Iowa try to prevent South Carolina from a perfect 38 and 0 season. Sports Hub headlines are brought to you by Eastern Massachusetts leader in pipelining. Drains by James. Slow drain, clog drain. You need to contact Drains by James today at drainsbyjames.com. I'm Alex Barth on Boston's Home for Sports, 98.5 The Sports Hub. Your next update at 10 o'clock. Pasternak got that I'm shot away. Shoots his head. Hi, this is David Pasternak. Pasternak for the low laser. And you're listening to 98.5 The Sports Hub. It's never too early to talk football on Sunday. Coming to the game on Sunday. This is Sunday Kickoff with Alex Barth and Saron Battle on 98.5 The Sports Hub. The Bills took, um, I think it was $31 million um, in terms of a cap hit this year. Didn't even do the June 1st uh, designation to split it out over two years. To me, that told me that the Bills wanted out of the stuff on Diggs' business, that they were sick of his act sick of um his little sort of comments here and there whether it's about josh allen or about some of the teammates or about the bills in general and that this is now the second team including the vikings that were just like yeah uh love the guy very talented but yeah we don't really want him around here anymore in this team environment should the patriots greg have been involved here no No, I I completely agree with you. The Patriots are not in a place yet to do this type of deal. Come back to Texas. That was Greg Bedard, Nick Cattles this week on the Greg Bedard podcast. Reacting to the trade, Stefan Diggs out of Buffalo goes to Houston for a second round pick. Texans also get a couple of late round picks back. And you kind of heard them lay it out there. Bills, they got a second round pick. It's a future second, not this year's second. They also had to give up later draft capital and eat thirty over $30 million to get rid of the guy. This was not an amicable parting of the ways. No. This was not, hey, we are going to make our football team better in the long term by sacrificing some in the short term. This was all the noise we heard about Buffalo over the last two years that all the bandwagon Bills fans, oh, you just don't like the Bills. You're just a hater. Patriots fans. No, it was all true. Mm-hmm. It's not all perfect. It's not all sunshine and roses. Josh Allen isn't this perfect teammate. Not that Diggs is either, but the point is yeah. there was friction there. Yeah. And now the Bills are in, in a reset. They mm-hmm. got no receivers. <clears throat> they got rid of a bunch of their defensive players. They don't have a ton of cap. Uh, this this was uh, – the Bills didn't – I don't think the Bills wanted to make this move. And you listen to Brandon Bean talk about it as well. Uh, after the fact, he didn't sound like somebody who wanted to make this move. Stefan Diggs shot his way out of Buffalo. Let's not tell that story any other way because he didn't yeah. want to be there. Yeah, I mean, and it was, I wouldn't say evident in the beginning because it was it was successful, meaning on field, statistical, whatever. But you saw the sideline blow ups from the very beginning. You know, when the I want the ball, I want the ball. Okay, I'm gonna throw you the ball is intercepted or he drops it. And then it's the pouting and, and the throwing stuff on the sidelines. It happened from the very beginning with them. 
But like you said, this offseason, they lost, what, they're probably their best corner, yep. both safeties, yep. Stephon Diggs. Yep. The defense was already yep. banged up to begin with. Gabe Another Davis wide receiver, said, no, yep, good. Gabe Davis. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm going to Jacksonville, you know, get out of Buffalo. And they're in a bad spot. I mean, they, could, they couldn't get rid of Josh Allen, but I think it was like, like you said, it's not all perfect with him. It's not, you know, he always the perfect teammate, whatever. It's just they, they just can't get rid of him. So that's why he's still there. But they're in a bad spot right now. And they to me, they've never been an attractive free agent market to begin with. So they're in a – for a team that took so long, we trusted the process since Jim Kelly left. <laughs> it's, been, it's been this long. For them to get this close and then all of a sudden everything just start collapsing around them is pretty crazy. But, you know, I, I, I'm not crying over it because it's good to see the Bills, you know, flop all right. over the place. And so, you mentioned you know. free agent destination. They're building a massive stadium. So yeah. the money not might not be flowing there in no. terms of trying to get guys to come and paying guys to come there. Uh, at, what, so what does this trade mean for the Patriots? though? And we'll start with the short term. Two wins. <laughs> <laughs> I say at least one. No, because Diggs was Diggs was the one that was beating them. It wasn't Allen. It was Diggs yeah. cooking J.C. Jackson every time. <laughs> yeah, and they do still play Diggs this year. They play Houston, so they're not totally yeah not out of woods there yet. Them, that one. Yet, but, but I yeah. think Diggs gonna be great in Houston. You know they yeah. they they and this is an amazing trade by Houston. Diggs is better than any receiver you're gonna get in the second round. They take the last three years off his contract, so now he's in a contract year. He's motivated. At the same mm -hmm. time, they're not tied to a wide receiver entering his age thirty season just in case. Masterclass by Nick Casario here. Great job. Yeah, and and they they're two guys are already when they're healthy. They're so fun to watch and yeah. uh, Dell and Collins. But now they're in a situation where it's like. They're not relying on Stefan Diggs, and but at the same time, there's nobody going to be doubling him or zoning in on him because the other guys took so, plus they're tied in. They just they have so much talent yeah. around. He just can't go in there demanding the ball and getting mad because other guys are eating. That's the only way he can disrupt that. Which we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. But what does this mean for the Patriots? Uh, short term, pretty solid idea of what the wide receiver market looks like. Mm -hmm. Second round pick. And yeah. Specifically for a guy like T. Higgins, is he worth more or less than Diggs? Diggs has more proven potential, but he's also older. Mm -hmm. Diggs, there were some contract things to work out. Higgins, there were some contract things to work out. But with Diggs, the Texans end up spending less money. With Higgins, you're obviously going to spend more. You're going to need to give him a new contract. Yeah. Maybe you don't get the fifth and sixth round pick back that, that the, the Texans did after giving up the second, but... I think the market is truly set for one of these top receivers at a second round pick. And even if that's not T Higgins this off season, which I don't think it will be for a number mm -hmm. of reasons, you look at the list of guys next year who are on expiring contracts. And obviously of course, you know, some of these guys are going to, they're going to get extensions or you're not going to trade for all of them. Mm -hmm. But you look at the list of guys whose contracts are expiring, both rookie deals and beyond that. And I'm trying to find my list here. I wrote this on uh, 985thesportsup.com. DK Metcalf, Terry McLaurin, DJ Moore, Jalen Waddell, Garrett Wilson, Devonta Smith. All guys whose deals could be up. I should have added, and I don't know why I didn't, because I'm reading for myself here. Uh, AJ Brown, a guy who, like Diggs, there's been some questions about how happy he is with his current, current situation. Yeah. I don't know about you, Saron. If the Patriots go into the draft this year, get their quarterback, get their left tackle, Mm -hmm. I'd give up a second round pick for again. I'll give you the list. You tell me if you wouldn't. I think I'd give up a second round pick for any of these guys: Metcalf, yeah, McLaurin, DJ Moore, yep. Jalen Waddle. I mean, you're not you're not trading for Garrett Wilson because the Jets aren't going to trade him to you. Same with Diggs. Like to me, the Patriots never would have been in on this. The Bills yep. would have never traded him in the division. Uh, and Devonta Smith. I'd give up a second for any of those guys. Yeah, easily, easily because they're proven guys, and yeah. for the majority, the young guys. And I think DJ Moore is way better than I think people realize. For him to do what he's doing out there with their quarterback situation in Chicago, I think is is pretty crazy. Now he can go out there with Caleb Williams coming in and absolutely light it up and the Bears just throw everything at him if they have it, you know, have right. it available. But any one of those guys I would absolutely take for a second round pick with no hesitation. And the reality is you're probably gonna have to, because as we've learned, and I think we talked about this a couple weeks ago, these top receivers don't hit the market. They either get a new contract from their team or when the team knows they won't pay them, they trade them and the other team gives them a new deal. Yeah. These well, guys you saw it this offseason. Right, exactly. So 
you can't, you know, I read that list and people say, why would you give up a second round pick if you can just sign one of them? I don't think any of those guys are getting a free agency. I don't think you're going to have the option to just sign one of them. It's going to come at the cost of some draft capital too. But, it, and honestly, I think I'd rather, not necessarily that I like, I mean, I like some of these players more than T. Higgins, but it's more just have the draft this year, get an idea of what the foundation is, get an idea of what you're working with. Mm-hmm. I would almost rather wait till next year because you have a better idea of what your offense is going to look like, what kind of receiver you want, yeah. and on and on and on. So, And you don't know what you need yet, what kind of receiver you need. Jalen Waddle is not the same as, as DJ Moore. You know what I'm saying? They're different types of guys. You can hit on somebody this year and say, okay, I got my X guy, whatever. Right. I got right. my big receiver. I got my speedy receiver. You don't know which kind of receiver you need yet. So like, like, like you said, you get you build what you build this year, and then next year you say, oh, I'm going to add to this. I'm going to add this type of receiver or whatever to that. So that's the short-term implication for the Patriots is that we kind of have a better idea of what the wide receiver market is. Thought maybe it dipped after Legereus Sneed, just the price of trading a star player, but this sets it a little bit more. What's the long-term implication in terms of the Patriots actually making a run at the playoffs again? And I don't know that this one move totally moved the needle, but I think it kind of woke you up to what's been happening in the AFC East over the Mm -hmm. last few months. Let's get into that next here on the Sports Hub Sunday kickoff. More Sunday kickoff coming up.
presented by Granite City Electric on 98.5, the Sports Hub. Every football game starts with a kickoff. This is Sunday Kickoff with Alex Barth and Sarone Battle on your home for Patriots football. 98.5, the Sports Hub. This is breaking sports news. Powered by Valvoline Instant Oil Change. On 98.5, the Sports Hub. All right, we're back with breaking Patriots news. How about this, Sarone? They didn't wait till after the show. <laughs> According to uh, multiple reports from NFL Network, Mike Garofalo, uh, Ian Rapport, Kyle Duggar, and the Patriots have agreed to a four-year deal with a base value of $58 million, worth up to sixty six, with $32.5 million guaranteed. He got paid. Mm-hmm. As I kind of, you know, try to figure out the numbers here, your thoughts. <laughs> hey, man, good for him. Um, you know, good for these guys. That, more so the, the whole offseason. They kind of kept the good players that they knew. They It's like, look, we, we, weren't, we weren't, maybe weren't as bad as we thought we were or whatever. But let's keep some of these good guys. And these are all guys we've talked about since last summer. We've all mentioned about paying their own guys, keeping guys in the bill. Pay the good guys. Pay the guys who've worked hard and worked their way up, and they've done it. And, you know, good for him getting paid. Uh, the morale for the team has got to be up. Everybody thinking like, oh, snap, they're paying guys around here now. You know, everybody's got to feel good about themselves. And that defense is going to be a pretty pretty solid defense going forward. And, you know, it's, just, it, it's good for him and good for the team. So by AAV average, of the base value of the contract. Kyle Duggar is now the sixth highest paid safety in football, according to OverTheCap.com. Okay. The only guys ahead of him, Derwin James, Minka Fitzpatrick, Antoine Winfield, who I believe is on the franchise tag, Xavier McKinney, and Jesse Bates. He is ahead of Buda Baker. He is ahead of... Kevin Byer, right. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just kind of scrolling down. I was waiting for the big name below him. No, they got this about right. Yeah. Because I think that's about where he slots in. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, it's it's a lot of money, but he's a good player. And you got to yeah. pay good that's players a lot of money. <laughs> uh, in terms of total value, to, you know, total base value, yeah, he's also sixth of the active safety contracts. In terms of guaranteed money, he's fifth. So he jumps McKinney by, like, $7 million. In terms of the the total guaranteed money, so they paid him right where he falls in. Yeah, if you were to rate them, that's where he would be, and that's you know. So they paid him accordingly. I mean, I think it's I think it's a win win for both of them for everybody. I mean, it, it's like I said, he's you you talking about coming to training camp bouncing. <laughs> this dude's going to be in great spirits by the time they get to camp, and I, I think it's a you know it's a good move by them. And again, with a defensive minded head coach, a head coach that knows this kid. He's paying him because he knows him. He knows his value to his defense. So I, I don't see anything wrong with this at all. I will say this, though. I, I would like to see, still like to see the Patriots out of safety in the draft. Mm-hmm. I'd still like to see him out of true free safety because you pay a guy this kind of money, maximize him. And Kyle Duggar's maximized. He's at his best when he's playing in the box, mm-hmm. when he's playing up front. Same with Jabril Peppers. He's at his best when he's playing up front. So you need somebody in the back end. I'd now. still like to see them out of guy to truly lock down the back end. And now you're back to that, you know, Devin McCourty, Patrick, and obviously those guys are great players. You know, you mm-hmm. hope you get that level of play, but that same kind of schematic setup. I would love to see something like that. So I still want to see him out of safety, but this is, a, this is a good deal and good for them for getting it done. Yeah, I mean, and, and is there anybody you would eyeball in the draft? A free safety type player. Of somebody who you can think of move back there that they can get in the draft a little, you know, not later in the draft, but fourth, fifth round or something well, like that. So, you know, not to spoil my mock draft tomorrow too much, but I may have gotten a little higher than that. Just give him a tease. A I tease. may, well, I may have gotten a little higher than that with safety position. Okay. So I'll tell That's you that. Right. But uh, a little later give on, taste. <laughs> uh, Cam Kitchens for Miami mm-hmm. later on day two is the guy I really like. And with Alfonso Highsmith, they have the connection in the building, right? Because he was at the U with yep. them. And I, a guy that was supposed to be a first round pick just had a bad combine. I I know what I see with my eyes, right? He's mm-hmm. an explosive player. I, I trust my eyes on that one. Um, Sione Vaki from Utah is a free safety and a running back. He's worked at both positions. Really? Uh, leading up to the draft, he played both positions at Utah. He's probably going to play both in the NFL. So he could be a fun ad. Kind of get yourself a second Marcus Jones. Um, mm-hmm. 
Dadrian Taylor Demerson from Texas Tech's another free safety you look at um, in the draft. And Evan Williams from Oregon, I guess, would be like my later day three guy. But there, there, there's some safeties in the draft they could add. I, yeah. I still think, because I was saying this last year when they had Duggar, I wanted to see them add a, a free safety. Um, but I, I getting Duggar back still helps. I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, this, I don't know, for me, it kind of, I wouldn't say it came out of nowhere, but you didn't really hear much talks about it. You didn't hear that this was close to being happening or close to a deal or something like that. It was like, boom, hey, here it is. And, you know, it, it's, like I said, it's encouraging for them, the whole thing with them signing, keeping their own guys. What does it mean for the other guys that contracts are coming up? How much money is going to be left for these guys? But I think it's a good thing that they're, they're retaining that they're, they're decent talent on this team. And I'll tell you, the guys, so when, the guys want to stay here. That's another good part. Right. When Kyle Duggar, not Kyle Duggar, when Josh Uche and Anthony Jennings resigned, they became the first, Uche was the first top 100 pick to sign a second contract with the Patriots since Logan Ryan. It was like a 10 year gap. Sheesh. And then Anthony Jennings became the first to sign a multi year extension with the team. Those guys obviously went second and third for the Patriots in that draft. Mm-hmm. Kyle Duggar, you ready for this? Kyle Duggar is the first top Patriots draft pick. So he wasn't first round, but first guy the, pick. The first pick, yeah. He is the first Patriots uh, uh, top draft pick to sign a second contract with the team since Nate Solder in 2011. Now, Dante Hightower was a first round pick in 2012, but he he went four picks after Chandler Jones. So yeah. there's a little bit of a, a, a wedge in there, but yeah, first since Nate Solder. Yeah, that, so there you go. I think it's a good sign for them to to keep guys, for them to want to keep guys around, and for these guys to be willing to stick around. It's a four win team. Usually, four win teams aren't attractive, and guys can't wait to get out of town. But a lot of these guys ended up resigning and sticking around. Part of defensive guys, maybe they really like Mayo. They 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 feel more highly of Mayo than some other people do. And these guys are willing to stick around and sign new deals to play under him. So I think that's a good sign for the Patriots. Uh, Tim and Lowell disagrees. Tim, what, what, what don't you like God, about the signing? Ter- what, what a terrible signing. An overrated player. You know, he he is a pretty good tackler. He commits the worst penalties at the most crucial times of the game. You look at his pass. It's always on a third and 15 he commits a penalty. He's just an overrated player. Jabril Peppers is a better player, more of an impact player. And I'm going to tell you something. This is a bad omen for Gerard Mayo as a coach. Because what it means is, if you're buddy-buddy with him, you're going to get paid. If he was so good of a player, why was he not assigned during the transition period by another team? Tell me that. Uh, because Maybe he was. Maybe teams were negotiating with him. Maybe that's why this deal got done. I'll also tell you this, Kyle Duggar, in 3,100 career snaps, has committed seven penalties. <laughs> Last year, played a career high 1,100 snaps. I think he played more snaps than anybody on the Patriots. 1,100 snaps last year, committed two. He's never committed more than two penalties in a season. So I don't know where that came from. Uh, yeah. Look, I, I, I had said this, and I still believe this, that... They could have afforded to move on from Kyle Duggar because of Jabril mm-hmm. Peppers. Right. I and I, I I still believe they could have. Yeah. But they've now left themselves more options for what they want to do defensively by having both. Yeah. That, that, that's the point I was gonna make when he said, Well, Bill Peppers is better. Like, okay, well, you still have both of them. Right. <laughs> They're still here. I mean, you're not <clears throat> ta- this team, they need talent. You have to accumulate talent. Having more than one guy at a position that's good. It's not a bad thing. You need talent. Peppers is, it was a, a good playmaker for them, but you have both of them. Maybe Peppers is allowed to be as good as he was because he has a, con- a chemistry with Duggar on his left side or whatever. They might work hand in hand together, but keeping them around is not a bad thing. And uh, when, like you said, I didn't I didn't know those stats about the penalties, but I'm I was trying to think in my head what big penalty. You know, he, he probably had, I think he might have had one in the Miami game in in the week two game, like just thinking back on it. But he's not this over. That's one thing he does very well. And he has his issues, especially in coverage. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to sit here and say he's and that's the thing. I'm not sitting here like, oh, yeah, they're going to win the Super Bowl. They locked up Kyle Duggar. But no. And look, if they had chosen him over Jabril Peppers, 
I wouldn't like it as much. Right. Let's say they both need to get paid, but that wasn't the case. We just ran through it. That's why I always go to, because the actual dollar amount doesn't matter to me. Because mm -hmm. it, 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 the contracts go up every year. It's inflation. I'm not going to sit here and pretend I know economics. I understand economics. I think I got like a C minus in economics in college. <laughs> but I understand that much, that every year the cap goes up, so the contracts go up. Mm -hmm. What I do understand, and what does matter to me, is where the contract sits relative to the other contracts. Because that's the only way you know if it's a good deal or not. Right. What are comparable players being paid? Right. They paid they him, made him the highest paid safety in the league. Then you'd be like, oh, yeah, no. Know? If they had given him $20 million a year, I'd be sitting here saying, what are you doing? Exactly. There's no need to do that. But they gave him the sixth right. highest paid safety in football. He's right there with, with – he's just behind Jesse Bates and Xavier McKinley. And Mc, uh, Xavier McKinney, who's a great comp because he just signed this offseason. Yeah, I'd put him just behind Xavier McKinney. If I was ranking safeties, I think Jesse Bates, frankly, is underpaid and his deals from a couple of years ago. So that might mm -hmm. be why. But, yeah. you know, he's just over Marcus Williams. It's about right. You may tell me Marcus Williams is a little bit of a better player. But again, when do those contracts come in? He's 28 years old. He's a little older than some of these guys. That's yeah. about right. It's That's about, about right. It's about right. So right. and when those when those younger guys when their new deals come up when their contracts run out they're probably going to leapfrog them because like you said they're a little younger and their contracts would, would be fresh it's not these right. old deals so I mean he's he's this is what they're paying these guys bottom line this is what a Kyle Duggar gets paid in the NFL and I'm just happy that the Patriots are the one who paid him and he didn't let the kid walk out the door that's that's basically the way I feel about it so if you want to weigh in on the Kyle Duggar signing six one uh six one seven 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 nine zero ninety eight five I do want to get back to Cerrone, that AFC East take I had mm -hmm. yeah so let's get if you call in on Duggar we'll still take the calls on Duggar six one seven 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 nine zero ninety eight five but I do want to get to the AFC East we'll do that next year on Sunday kickoff stay tuned for more Sunday kickoff on the
98.5 The Sports Hub. Alex Barth and Sarone Battle are here, here, talking football every Sunday morning with the insiders and with you. It's Sunday kickoff on 98.5 The Sports Hub. The Bills will be. I think they're going to still have a good chance to win that division and make the playoffs, but I don't think they're a legitimate Super Bowl contender anymore. Not only are they not a legitimate Super Bowl contender, but the Buffalo Bills have done it again. They've missed another field goal wide right. They've thrown in the white towel. They've choked on a chicken wing bone. They are dead to the AFC East, and they have just handed over the AFC Division title to the New York Jets. Mark wow. it down. Remember, put it in your memory. Mark this tape when they don't win the division and when they don't make the playoff. The Bills make me want to shout. Kick your heels up and shout. Throw your hands up and shout. Throw your head back and shout. Come Welcome on back. Sports Hub Sunday kickoff. Alex Barth's own battle here. 98.5sports.com. Take you up until 10 o'clock. Of course, Patriots did just uh, re-sign Kyle Duggar, four-year contract worth $58 million. If you want to react to that, 617-779-0985. I, I do want to, as we wait for the calls to come in, so pick up where we left off before, and we're reacting to the Stefan Diggs trade and what it means for the Patriots long-term. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and as I look ahead, let, let, let's take quick stock of where the AFC East is right now. You have the Patriots, who are re- totally hitting the reset button post Bill Belichick era, new coach, new GM, yep. uh, trying a new approach, new everything. They are starting from scratch. You have the Buffalo Bills, who have Josh Allen looking around like Will Smith and the Fresh Prince of Bel Air meme, <laughs> looking around the empty room, and a coach who is determined to fire any and everybody in the building in order to save his own job. His seat's red hot. And now the only person left he can get rid of is the quarterback. So mm-hmm. it's going to be, it's coming down to those two. You have the Miami Dolphins, who are 5-10 and 10 against teams 500 or better in the last two years. And they have some pressing decisions coming up on contracts with guys like Jalen Waddell and, and Tua tonga Vailoa. Mm-hmm. Are they going to commit to Tua or are they going to restart? And then you have the Jets, who are counting on a 40-year-old vice presidential candidate coming off a blown Achilles. <laughs> to lead them to the promised land. And they're also, let's not forget, as good of a roster as they have, they're the Jets. It's who they mm-hmm. are. That's a part of it. Yeah. Last year, this division was supposed to be a murderer's row. And we heard that didn't matter what the Patriots did because it was going to be the Bills, the Jets, and the Dolphins for the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. And I said at the time, you never, ever play that game in the NFL. Nope. You never, at well, the next five years... Well, the next six years, nope, not how yeah. it works. Yeah. Not remotely how it works. I'm your witness. I was here with you when you said it. <laughs> and and look, and I'm I'm so I'm gonna sit here and say like, because the whole point is, and I don't think it's gonna happen this year. I still think the Jets will win the division because the mm-hmm. it's a little tongue in cheek with the Jets and Rodgers. Like his Achilles yeah. is an issue. How he bounces back is an issue. But they have a good roster. They should be at least competitive. And then if Rodgers is good, they they have a tremendous ceiling. It's not going to happen this year for the Patriots. Mm-hmm. But who is the long-term owner of the AFC East? I don't think you can say anybody. Because put, if, if the ahead. Patriots hit on the quarterback pick, they have as good a chance as anybody right now. Mm-hmm. So that's not to say, oh, the division's back open, they're going to go get it. It's not to say they're going to win it this year. But the, the door is wide open for anybody. We talked about it was good, the Bills division, the Bills division, the Bills division. That's over. They could still win it, but they're not the favorite. Nobody's the favorite, and nobody is built to be a long-term favorite as much as you can be built for that in the NFL. It's just funny to see what happened to the AFC East in the course of a year. And it's it's like you said, you can never project five years ahead in the NFL. The NFL, the whole system is made for everybody at the top to fall and the people at the bottom to rise up every few years. It just it flips around. It's the way it is. The Patriots being good, sustained, good for that long is just—it's not the way the the game is designed. The league is designed. Everybody else, it it, it turns over, over and over again. You get the Steelers, your Ravens, your Patriots that kind of just hang around near the top. But other than that, everybody else is just jumbled around every every single year. Some new teams rise up, and now you look at the AFC East, and it's like, okay, let's say the Jets do win the Super Bowl this year. 
once they have those guys win, they get paid. They're all going to leave. Right. Rogers is going to retire. Mike Williams has already got a bad ACL. Contracts are going to be up with Brees Hall and Wilson and all those other good young guys. The bills are already falling apart. Part. The Dolphins are a bad month away from everybody getting fired. <laughs> and then you're left sitting there. You're the one with the young, fresh quarterback that everybody's looking at. Now you could easily go become the team that everybody's chasing. The Texans. Because now they're looking for quarterbacks year after year after year where you're already ahead of the curve with that young quarterback. You're, and, and look, unless Sean McDermott is truly beyond reproach. Like, two of the three teams the AFC East realistically could be looking for a new quarterback in the next five years. The Bills shouldn't be, but like I said, Sean McDermott, scapegoat as offensive coordinator, scapegoat yeah. as defensive coordinator, scapegoat as best receiver. All that's Second left is, I guess, <laughs> the, the GM, although that may come down to, I'm going to fire you before you can fire me, and the quarterback. That's it. Yeah. So they might not need a quarterback, but they're going to need everything else. The Jets are going to need a quarterback in a couple of years, even if, like you said, even if they are competitive this year. I wouldn't be surprised they took one this year. I Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Like, they should, but also, how much do they want to play Kate Rogers? Because Rogers doesn't want them to. Mm-hmm. And do they not want to risk ticking him off like the Packers did? But they they should. You're right, they should. And we'll see what happens with the Dolphins, and we'll see what happens with Tua, because that, that contract situation is going to be really interesting to see what happens with him here in the next year or two because uh, yeah, his I mean, contract's due to be up. I, but like you said, I think the Patriots, if you look at look at these signings, you yeah. know, Duggar getting signed. It's four years now. You still have Duggar. You, 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 if you get Barmore signed up, if you get these other guys, you got Gonzalez. You, I don't know what they're going to do with Judon. But you've got the young studs now on defense. So you already know your defense is going to be good. The Patriots are a good draft away from taking this division right back. And like you said, it's it's not because they're just as great, you know, they're this great team right now, but they're in a, a, a in the earlier stages of a rebuild than everybody else is, and everybody else is still kind of holding on hope that maybe this is our year. And meanwhile, they're just falling apart. But you're in a good position. I mean, in the AFC, to be honest with you, I mean, Kansas City's Kansas City. They are the the top dogs right now, but the Chargers have fallen back. We thought they were going to be a juggernaut. Cincinnati has lost some key pieces. I think they strengthened the offensive line, but they could lose T. Higgins. They've lost Joe uh, Mixon. They're, they're losing pieces to that thing that got them to the Super Bowl. So I don't think they're a mighty team. S- the Steelers are going to be the Steelers, as long as Tomlin's there. Yeah. Ravens are going to be good. Houston is an up-and-coming team. Other than that, everybody's the same as the AFC East. So, I don't. again, I don't think they're as far away from being a decent team, a competitive team in AFC, as some fans want to believe. And they've kept this core to bring it back mm-hmm. to the news of the day. They yep. keep Kyle Duggar. They, they they don't really need to do much on defense. I still no. think they need a free safety. They need mm-hmm. a, a like rotational corner. And they probably need another edge rusher. But that can be yeah. later. But it all goes back to, yeah, as much as we're sitting here saying, oh, the door's wide open for the Patriots. It's the quarterback. Have to, have to. Have to hit on the quarterback, and if only it was that easy, right? Yeah, that's, that's it's it. only it's all you got to do. Is the just only the thing you have to do is just maybe the, the the hardest thing to do in the front <laughs> in in any sports front office: identify and obtain a franchise quarterback. That's it. Just that. That's one all thing. you have to do. Right. Just get the right quarterback. That's the best of the division. That's all you have to do. It's easy he to just make. Has to be better than Aaron Rodgers and Josh Allen. You're good to go. It's easy to make a billion dollars. All you got to do is win the Powerball. That's all it. All you got to do is buy a ticket, right? Five all you got to do is buy the right ticket. <laughs> so that's where the Patriots are at. But it, I, I, I just think it's interesting to look at. And, and a lot of this happened before Diggs got traded. It's not like Diggs yeah. got traded and suddenly the entire division fell apart. But no, it, I, but it does, I think, open things up, puts things in, things in perspective. Yeah. And, and you know, the Jets, again, one injury made them a terrible team. Uh, two has gone down many times before. Things can change fast in the NFL. So these sustained, like you said, Stop looking at the league five, six years in advance because it didn't work that way. Nobody thought the Houston Texans were going to be a juggernaut. The, what? A year ago this time, nobody thought the Texans right. were going to be legit. And yet here they are. 617-779-0985. You want to weigh in on the Duggar signing. You want to weigh in on the AFC East, all of it. We'll uh, take some calls next as we wrap things up here on the Sports Hub Sunday kickoff. Oh, Sunday kickoff is on the way.
1230 right here on the Sports Hub. Let's wrap it up here, Saron, with some calls. Uh, Floyd in Michigan on the quarterbacks. Floyd, thanks for hanging on. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for taking my call. Uh, I want to go back to Adam Schefter, that segment. First of all, Schefter has been wrong before, so let's not make like he's Moses and the Bible. The question is, why did he bring up the Raiders? Is it possible that the Washington Commanders are using Schefter to send a message to the Raiders about Jaden Daniels, who has been widely interested in him? Thank you for taking my call. No problem. Uh, maybe. Good point. I, I meant to ask for Washington. Question, why did he go in on throwing the Raiders into that mix like that? Uh, maybe somebody from the Raiders told him to put that out there so the fans know they're interested in quarterback. Maybe, he, again, he's just flexing what he knows because he's Schefter and he can do that. Mm-hmm. Maybe the Raiders trade up for him. I just don't see the commanders moving out of that pick. Yeah, I don't I don't see them. I don't see the, the coaching staff willing to get crucified for <laughs> moving out of that position and taking somebody later. I, I can't see them doing it. I'd be it'd be so Washington for them to do it though. Right. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> All right, let's go to uh Guy in Houston. Guy. Hey, good morning guys. How are you? Hey good morning. Um so my point is that uh, there's a lot of talk about um trading back, right? Yep. But um the way I see that if you can go to the last ten Super Bowl winners and tell me who is the most important player on that team, and just wake me up when you get to last tackle, okay? Hey, wait, what was the last part? Wake, wake, wake you up and what? Wake tackle. me up when you get to last tackle, okay? Like the point is, uh, obviously, the quarterback is the guy that matters. So, okay, right? Um, yeah, no, good call, guy. What I would say, yeah, maybe, maybe the left tackle is not the most important, but isn't the guy who protects the most important player pretty freaking important too? Yeah. Uh, it, t- put it like this: Tampa Bay would have won a second Super Bowl with Tom Brady if their offensive line could right. stay upright. The Chiefs would have <laughs> another one again, the one against Tampa when their offensive line imploded. Yeah, Bengals, uh, Cincinnati, the right? Cincinnati Bengals, Bengals would have gotten close. No, they, I they were in the Super Bowl when he got sacked what sixty times that season. He got sacked yeah. nine times in the AFC Championship game. If he had anything better around him, Joe Burrow probably would. Don't go look at the Super Bowl winners. Look at the teams that didn't win the Super Bowl, and you can go right back to them not having a left tackle. Right. I don't think your left tackle needs to be your best player. No, he doesn't does, have to but be. Does he be need, good, though. Right. He needs to be probably one of your three or four best offensive players. Yeah. And in a league where tackle depth is so thin, there are not 64 starting caliber tackles walking the mm-hmm. face of the earth. There's just yeah. not. There's not 32 starting caliber left tackles. Like, it's just, there are guys who are at, we saw last year with the Patriots, right? There's guys who are out there who flat out aren't good enough. It's mm-hmm. tough to get one of those guys. If you want to get one, you either got to make a real investment or get really, really, really lucky with player development. And one thing I would like to add, I think that yeah. caller was in Houston. Yep. C.J. Stroud isn't C.J. Stroud without that left tackle they got. It's a great point. <laughs> it's a great point. The Texans aren't the Texans. None of this works if they don't have... That stud at left tackle down there in Houston. Laramie Tunsil. Yeah. And, and I, look, I'm not saying t- take the tackle third. No. But take him 34th one. or maybe move up and take him? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd do that. Yeah. I'd certainly do that. Yeah, you better get your one. <laughs> so I, that's I, I don't mean to pick on the caller, but no. No, ta- not at all. But like, the same. The, the Niners aren't the Niners without with that trim- left tackle. Well, they, and they, remember right. that that game with they, or that postseason run where they kept trying to take Trent Williams and use him as a fullback and they were putting him in motion and it just it never worked I wonder why they keep mo- <laughs> motioning their best blocker away from the play right now they don't have any blocking <laughs> exactly so I yeah but yeah you need a left tackle man to win you do you don't need as you said it had to be the third pick in the draft but you got to come away with a decent left tackle a pro bowl left tackle helps but a good one is really is is a bonus all right, Saron, what are you looking for? What are you looking for this next week? I mean, we're done with events, right? No more combine, no more Nothing pro days. We, we've still got top thirties, but there's not much to react. We just know the guys are in the building. We don't know more than that. What is, what's the big Patriot story coming out of this next week? Oh man, will they will they be like we mentioned earlier, this trades and stuff happening in the league? Will the Patriots do anything else to this roster? Um will will I mean you know better than me than I would on this one. Will you start seeing teams make these deals for these draft picks? Will Team stop move up or is it too early? I'm not sure, but I think you can see some some front office type stuff, some trades going on around the league, and I'm curious to see if the Patriots are going to be involved in any of this. 
I, I think with the picks, that's becoming more common. You used to just not see that until draft night. But, look, and we all thought, so the pick that Houston traded to Buffalo for Diggs is one mm-hmm. of the ones they got in that trade with Minnesota a couple weeks ago. And we okay. all thought it was Minnesota setting something up, right? Oh, they have two first-round picks. They're going to move up, take quarterback. Yeah. We all thought that trade happening early was Minnesota setting something up. No. It was Houston. It was Houston setting something up. So, yeah. you know, my gut says, no, we're probably more or less done with trades till the draft, but this is becoming more and more of a common thing where just teams, they want to get their board set. They know where they want to pick. They know what guys they want to target. So maybe maybe we do see another kind of trade like that. I think it's more likely we see, if there was a trade, a player trade, but maybe we do see another trade where it's just teams moving around the board, and we've gotten a couple of these now. We had Minnesota this year. The the Saints and Eagles made that weird one last year where they're like 15 picks involved. Yeah. And it was just, that was a nightmare. I hated that trade. It was too much to keep track of. <laughs> you obviously had the Niners and Dolphins and, um, why, why am I blanking on the third team in that one? The Niners, Dolphins, and somebody else oh. in 2021. Who was it? No, no, no. What, what I was going to add real quick, these things yeah. this week, try Will you see some activity from Kansas City in the draft trying to get some picks? Seeing that their wide receiver situation might be a little <laughs> a little iffy now going into the offseason. Will you see Kansas City's name thrown out there a little more with some of these young receivers? So, again, a little spoiler alert. You can try, check out my mock draft tomorrow. Oh, my, my bad. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. So I, anything to plug it. I might have the Chiefs getting a little aggressive. And they, okay, the Chiefs, they, here's the thing. The Chiefs love trading up. The Chiefs yeah. love trading up in the draft. And now, like, well... It's not. What are they trading up for? Are they trading up for a receiver? Or are they trading up for a corner? Because they sure. lost Snead too. Yeah. There. I, I. I think the Chiefs are. Tra- 